my great privilege this morning of introducing uh, the Reverend John Meyer for the Schaefer Lectures of 2006-2007. Today, um, he is giving a second of three lectures on the danger of making Jesus a Christian, the test case of law and morality. Tomorrow, just so you can mark your calendars, um, he'll be speaking on the Jewish Jesus and the purity laws at 10.30, and we'll have a conversation with him at 11.30. In introducing John Meyer yesterday, Dean Attridge spoke eloquently about his many accomplishments. Um, it's a venerable list that I'm not going to repeat, although it's certainly worthy of reiteration. I want instead to touch very briefly on the depth and importance of one sustained accomplishment um, as it points us forward to his talk today, his writing the three volumes of A Marginal Jew in 1991, 94, and 2001. The idea of it makes my hand cramp. Um, this monumental labor, a marginal Jew, has justly gained Professor Meyer international attention for his meticulous and masterful weighing of the evidence for the historical Jesus. His thesis that Jesus was a marginal Jew in a marginal first century Eastern Mediterranean society weighs heavily, therefore, in a raging and sometimes public scholarly uh, quest for the true Jesus of history. Um, uh, this quest is made even more timely by the uproar over the Da Vinci Code, um, uh, which is a p peculiarly modern um, endeavor. Unlike the ancient and medieval world, our age wants the facts. Um, some in our society, some biblical scholars too, would say if you can't measure something scientifically or historically, it ain't real. Professor Myers' work assiduously avoids that trap recognizing both the value of and the differences between the doing of history on the one hand and the living of confessional faiths on the other. Professor Myers as a marginal Jew reflects the best kind of historical research, a balanced and, in my opinion, deeply moral scholarship that recognizes the ethical, social, and ideological problems of conf conflating the quests of a given age for the Jesus of history, the Jesus of faith, the Jesus of the Da Vinci Code, the Jesus of the 21st century, in a package that in the hands of experts can look to others like the objective truth about the Christian Christ. Please give your warmest welcome to John Meyer, who will speak today on the Jewish Jesus and the Sabbath. John Meyer. Thank you. It is a great, let me stress once again what a great privilege and honor it is to be here at Yale addressing you with all the marvelous resources of Yale throughout. Last night I went to uh, the great new uh, play at the Yale Repertory Center, Eurydice, uh, and just I marvel at the resources you have here at Yale. In fact, uh, if some of you, and you should catch Eurydice, which is in its last week right now, make sure you do not drink, though, from the River Lethe, lest you forget the thread of the argument for these three lectures. Just in case you did, let me remind you, in yesterday's lecture, we faced head-on a key problem in any treatment of Jesus and the law. The Jewish Jesus, while presupposing and affirming the law in general, rejected an important social institution permitted and regulated by the law, namely divorce. Indeed, he declared that anyone who carefully followed the Mosaic law in divorcing and remarrying sinned against a commandment of the Decalogue, thou shalt not commit <laughs> adultery. And we left ourselves hanging, as you should always in a lecture series, namely, what are we to make of all this? If nothing else, we are reminded that the Mosaic law was a fluid and contested reality in first century Palestine, and Jesus took part in the lively argument. The historical Jesus is the halakhic Jesus. Perhaps we can gain greater clarity on the position of the historical Jesus vis-a-vis -vis the law by broadening our circle of inquiry to include another and indeed much more central institution than divorce, an institution enshrined in and positively commanded by the Torah, namely the Sabbath. Now it may seem almost foolhardy to try to tackle the two topics of the Sabbath and the historical Jesus in a single lecture. 
A bookshelf in my office is in danger of collapsing from all the volumes and articles on the Sabbath that have appeared in recent years. Obviously, this second lecture will have to grapple with the question of Jesus and the Sabbath only in a very schematic fashion. In outline form, then, I will attempt to tackle this immense topic by way of three main questions which you have on your handy uh, handout. First question, in a number of gospel stories, Jesus himself is in- accused of violating the Sabbath. Do any of these stories go back to the historical Jesus? Second, does the story of Jesus defending his disciples against the charge that they, not he, violate the Sabbath go back to Jesus? And third, do any of the detachable sayings of Jesus on the Sabbath go back to him? We, we begin then with the first question, the question that covers the vast majority of the narrative material dealing with Jesus and the Sabbath. Specifically, we ask, do any of the stories in the four Gospels where Jesus himself is accused of directly violating the Sabbath have a chance of going back to the historical Jesus? At first glance, the answer would seem to be obviously yes. Most, if not all, of the Gospel sources, certainly Mark, special Matthew, special Luke, and John, and some would add Q, both in narratives and in sayings, present Jesus battling with opponents over Sabbath observance. Surely this multiple attestation of sources and forms proves that such substantive conflicts over the Sabbath do go back to the historical Jesus. But, and there was always the but in historical Jesus research, a but as questers of the historical Jesus should know by now, a quick initial overview of multiple sources and forms proves little or nothing. It is simply an initial clue, which you then have to pursue in detail. The individual cases need to be probed in detail before they can constitute a convincing argument. Granted the limitations of time, I will outline ever so briefly what such a detailed probe would look like and what I think its upshot should be. The outline of this probe proceeds in six obviously imperfect, because there are six, six imperfect steps. Step one involves the general but vital observation that in all four Gospels, Jesus himself is directly accused of violating the Sabbath in only one way, namely by healing illnesses on the Sabbath. Nothing else, ever. As we shall see in our second major question, Jesus' disciples are accused of plucking grain and therefore of reaping on the Sabbath in Mark 2. But the Mark in Jesus is not presented as joining in the action he then defends. In John 5, the paralytic by the pool of Bethsatha is accused of carrying his mat after his healing on the Sabbath. Jesus never carries a mat. But in both the synoptics and John, Jesus is, himself is accused only of healing and therefore of breaking the Sabbath, even in those cases where the healing involves no physical action on Jesus' part, whatever. He simply says, get up before everybody stretch out your hand. He doesn't do a thing. Still, he violates the Sabbath by healing, we are told. It is amazing to see how consistently commentaries on the Gospels either take for granted or supposedly prove by a quick reference to Jewish sources that at the time of Jesus, the act of healing was considered a violation of the Sabbath. But is that so? Always beware of the argument, we all know that sociology of knowledge. Let us take a look at the relevant sources. Was healing considered a violation of the Sabbath at the time of Jesus? In step two, we consider the Jewish scriptures, Tanakh. In the Pentateuch, the basic obligation of the Sabbath is to abstain from work, melacha. That is all. No positive act of public worship is imposed on the ordinary Israelite. The problem is the Pentateuch supplies only a few examples. 
of what constitutes the type of work that is prohibited. The basic and original object of the prohibition was agricultural work, especially sowing and reaping, to which were added the gathering of wood, the kindling of fire, the preparation of food, and undertaking a lengthy journey. That was about it. Intriguingly, some of the most important halakhic prohibitions come not from the Mosaic law, but rather from the latter prophets, where the prohibition is extended to urban business and the carrying of burdens in public. Always be aware of that trap. Oh, the prophets were against legal observance. They were the free spirits. A lot of halakha comes from the prophets, not the Pentateuch. In post-exilic Jerusalem, Nehemiah still had to struggle against the sale of merchandise and agricultural produce on the Sabbath, and this in Jerusalem. Indeed, Ostraca fragments may indicate that even in the first century CE, some Palestinian Jews continued to ignore the ban on commerce. This then is a summary of the surprisingly sparse details of what kind of work Tanakh forbids on the Sabbath. Not a word you notice about healing. The deuterocanonical or apocryphal books included in some Christian Bibles add little to the list of prohibited works. The only new directives come from 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Jewish soldiers are permitted to fight defensive battles on the Sabbath, but may not initiate attacks. In addition, all Jews are to be exempt from paying duties and tolls and from appearing in court on the Sabbath. No healing in sight. Step three brings us to new and richer halakhic fields as we survey the non-canonical Jewish literature of the last two centuries BCE. The two most significant sources are the Book of Jubilees and the Damascus document, now supplemented by the fragments from Cave 4 at Qumran. In Jubilees, we find for the first time normative lists of prohibited works, a new kind of literary genre or gatung. Indeed, the stringency of Jubilees sectarian halakha extends this list of prohibited works so widely that it encompasses such diverse and otherwise permitted activities as sexual intercourse with one's wife and then any, any military battle on the Sabbath. A still more extensive list is found in the Damascus document in what scholars call the Sabbath Codex. Taking for granted most of the biblical prohibitions, the Damascus document lays down punctilious rules about a wide range of matters. Here at last, some scholars claim, we find the very first prohibition of medical treatment on the Sabbath. More precisely, scholars like Lutz During in his mammoth-driven work, fittingly entitled Shabbat, sees in an obscure prohibition in the Damascus document, column 11, lines 9 and 10, a first step in the direction of forbidding healing activity on the Sabbath. This passage reads, quote, let no one carry samanim on himself, that is on his body, to go out or to come in on the Sabbath. End quote. Since there is no other Jewish Palestinian text prior to Jesus that explicitly prohibits acts of healing on the Sabbath, this text is understandably seized upon as prime evidence that healing was indeed forbidden by the Sabbath halakha of at least some groups. However, two aspects of the text make this attempt at creating a parallel highly problematic. First, the exact meaning of the key noun samanim is disputed. Various scholars suggest the meaning perfume, fragrant powder, spices, medicine, healing or hurtful powder, or of course, soon after medicine, poison. While the reference to medicine is possible, it is not certain. Second, in a sense though, the precise meaning of the noun is beside the point. The context shows that the focus of the prohibition is the action of carrying objects in and out of one's house or of lifting an object on the Sabbath. Whatever the meaning of samanim, the question is whether such an object can count as clothing 
which one can certainly carry on one's body, even on the Sabbath, or whether it counts as some sort of burden that one is not allowed to transport on the Sabbath. In some, granted the long and wide-ranging list of prohibited works in Jubilees and at Qumran, the silence about healing is eloquent. Cum tacet clamant, as Cicero would say. Step four brings us to the Jewish diaspora around the turn of the era. Despite the fact that Sabbath observance was one of the most distinguishing features of Jewish life in the eyes of their pagan neighbors, large parts of this Jewish literature do not treat the topic. Even when an author like Aristobulus gives some philosophical consideration to the Sabbath, the mystical number seven, he never lists detailed prescriptions governing observance. While Philo of Alexandria does not give us a single catalog of prohibited acts like the Damascus document, he does supply, unlike so many other diaspora authors, a good number of Sabbath prohibitions, many of which are found in or are clearly derived from the Jewish scriptures. Josephus understandably has much less than Philo to say by way of detailed Sabbath prohibitions. The important point for us is that once again, none of these authors writing in Greek around the time of Jesus ever mentions healing as one of the prohibited works. Well, having failed to find any background to the idea that Jesus' healing activity violates the Sabbath in the literature before 70 CE, our only recourse is to move ahead to step five, namely the Mishnah redacted around 200 CE with all the problems that the use of later rabbinic works for the time of Jesus entails. At first glance, our prospects are promising. Since the Mishnaic tractate Shabbat offers the full flowering of all the list in Jubilee and Qumran, namely the famous list of 39 prohibited works. But then we are chagrined to find out that in this grand list of 39 works, drawing in all sorts of marginal actions as prohibited on the Sabbath, in the list of the grand 39 works covering just about everything imaginable, healing is never mentioned. Nor is it mentioned in the different list in Tractate Yom Tov. Intriguingly, one must search outside of these set lists to find in the Tractate Shabbat some statements of individual rabbis forbidding certain specific actions that intend to supply healing or comfort to a sick person. Even here, the decisions are hedged around with considerations of intention and amount of activity involved, and in true rabbinic fashion, dissenting voices are heard. One gets the impression that the prohibition of curative actions on the Sabbath is a relatively new and not undisputed arrival on the scene. This impression is reinforced by the curious provision in Shabbat 6.2. A man is allowed to carry an amulet out of his house on the Sabbath only if the amulet has proven curative power. An amulet without such proven ability is not permitted to be carried out of the house on the Sabbath. Now, this is the last thing one would have expected if healing per se were an activity always everywhere and in all its forms forbidden on the Sabbath. If that were the case, one would expect the ineffective amulet to be permitted and the effective amulet to be banned. <laughs> Thus, even in the Mishnah, healing in itself does not have the aura of an age-old prohibition accepted by all under all circumstances. The overall impression one gets from these and other rabbinic texts when viewed in the context of the total absence of any prohibition of healing on the Sabbath in the pre-70 period is that the post-70 rabbis had developed a new type of Sabbath prohibition concerning healing. Even with the prohibitions in the Mishnah, we should remember that these texts represent the views of the scholarly elite and did not always find a ready reception among the common people. 
These texts are prescriptive, not necessarily descriptive. If, for instance, in the 22nd century, a sociologist of religion wanted to find out what American Catholics do and believe day in and day out in 2006, the last thing he or she should do is go to the Code of Canon Law and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. <laughs> it would be the ultimate example of mistaking a prescriptive document for a descriptive one. The same thing should be remembered when we use the rabbinic literature. It is with the insights we have gained from this rapid tour through Jewish literature before, during, and after the time of Jesus that we take step six, a brief consideration of the gospel stories of healing on the Sabbath. In my opinion, the two stories in John's gospel can both be dismissed without further ado because form and tradition criticism confirm what any intelligent reader should notice immediately. Unlike the synoptic stories, where the Sabbath is mentioned early on and repeatedly in the stories of healing, neither the healing of the paralytic in John 5 nor the healing of the man born blind in John 9 contains any reference to the Sabbath in the miracle story proper. It is only after the miracle story proper is finished and the polemical dialogue begins that the evangelist, almost as an afterthought, mentions, oh, by the way, the healing took place on the Sabbath, which allows me to go ahead with the controversy. What we have here is a clear case of the redactional technique of John as he goes about building his huge literary structures that take up whole chapters. In both chapter five and chapter nine, we have John's characteristic pattern of sign, leading to polemical dialogue, which in turn leads to Christological monologue. It is telling that in chapters five and nine, neither the sign nor the lengthy monologue contains any mention of the Sabbath whatever. Thus, when isolated as discrete units of the Jesus tradition, the healings in chapters five and nine have nothing to do with the Sabbath and for the quest do not really count as Sabbath healings. We are left then with the Sabbath healings in the synoptics that cause a dispute. Apart from parallel texts, there are only three such miracles plus disputes on the Sabbath in the synoptics. Indeed, there is only one Sabbath healing plus dispute in the whole of Mark. Astounding when you stop to think of it the man with the withered hand in Mark 3, 1 to 6. Although Matthew takes over this Markan story with additions, he has no similar story from his own tradition. In contrast, besides taking over the Markan story, Luke provides two of his own. The woman bent over for 18 years in 13, 10 to 17, and the man with dropsy in 14, 1 to 6. Interestingly, when in volume two of A Marginal Jew, thousands of years ago, I treated these stories under the rubric of miracle stories and not Sabbath dispute stories, I judged that none of them sufficiently satisfied the criteria of historicity to ground a judgment of probably historical. Each time my judgment was the frustrating but frank non liquet, not clear either way. If questions for the historical Jesus would accept that category besides the one approved or rejected, we'd be much better off, I think. When one adds to that initial judgment non liquid, what we have just seen in this quick survey, I think the judgment must tip decidedly in the direction of not historical. Because before 70 CE, no Jewish source of any stripe, sectarian or mainstream, canonical or non-canonical, Palestinian or diaspora, none states that healing activity is a violation of the Sabbath. When such a judgment finally appears in the Mishnah, it gives every indication of being a relatively new halakhic position. Hence, it is highly unlikely that a Palestinian Jewish faith healer called Jesus, active around the years 28 to 30 CE, would have met repeated objections to his supposedly curative actions on the grounds that they violated the Sabbath. 
Well, what then is the origin of these stories? I would suggest, and it's only a suggestion, I would suggest that one possible origin lies in the apologetic and polemical activity of Palestinian Jews for Jesus in the time frame from 30 to 70 CE. One should remember that a great deal of religious apologetics and polemics is not actually aimed outwards at opponents who would never read or listen to such material anyway. Who are we kidding? Rather, quite often, religious apologetics and polemics are in reality aimed inward to bolster the faith cohesion and self-identity of a group that feels under siege by the larger surrounding society. Granted this function of apologetics and polemics, one need not be surprised that they indulge in exaggeration, caricatures, and stereotypes rather than in sober reporting of opponents' views. Behind a great deal of popular religious literature and apologetics then and now is the unspoken presupposition, we're right and they're wrong, now let's think up some reasons why they're wrong. Perhaps we might even extend this hypothesis a step further. We have noticed already that there is only one Sabbath healing plus dispute in the whole Markan tradition. While we find two in Luke and two more in the final redactional form of John's Gospel, it may be that the growth of such disputes about healing on the Sabbath in the later post-70 Gospels may be a first hint and polemical echo of the emergence in early rabbinic thought of an opinion that healing activity did indeed violate the Sabbath. In fact, it may be that in a number of cases of halakhic dispute, the first manifestations of a rabbinic position may actually be enshrined literarily in a passage of the New Testament. Think, for instance, of Matthew's acceptive clause, the first case literally we have an argument about grounds for divorce. I dare say we are only at the beginning of the process of mining New Testament material in a critical rather than a struck Billebeck fashion to create a fuller and more accurate history of the development of Jewish halacha at the turn of the era. Be that as it may, the result of this brief probe is that none of the gospel stories of Jesus being accused of violating the Sabbath by healing goes back to the historical Jesus. Thus, a good deal of the material that has been traditionally used to define the attitude of the historical Jesus toward the Sabbath disappears. You laughed when I said in the first lecture, the only thing I know is that every book and article about Jesus and law is wrong you begin to see why I think every single book and article is wrong. Now, this does not necessarily mean that Jesus did not engage at all in halakhic disputes about Sabbath observance. I think he did. We still have to face the second and third questions that I raised at the beginning of this lecture, namely another narrative about Jesus and the Sabbath, the plucking of grain on the Sabbath, and finally the detachable sayings of Jesus on the Sabbath. But in my opinion, the disputes that arise from Jesus' healing on the Sabbath must fall by the wayside. Let us move on then to point two. There is one Sabbath dispute story that, as I've said, I have purposely not treated until now, namely the dispute about the plucking of grain on the Sabbath in Mark 2, 23 to 28 parallels. You have the key Markin pericope there on your second sheet if you would follow along with me. This does get a little bit hairy at times, especially when the English translation, and practically no English translation, represents the Greek at some pivotal points in the text. So all, you can all whip out your Greek New Testament as well. This story stands out because its content and structure have no exact parallel anywhere else in the four Gospels. Alone among the Sabbath dispute stories, Mark 2, 23 to 28, has no connection with Jesus' miracles. 
is not ignited by something Jesus himself says or does and reaches its climax not in one saying or action of Jesus, but rather in a chain of three separate sayings that are at best loosely connected with one another. It is my contention that if we pay careful attention to the literary structure of this curious story, we will have an entree into the questions of its original form and its historicity. Let us take a look, therefore, first of all, at the structure of the story of the plucking of the grain. It is dismaying to see how often commentators rush to a consideration of pre-Marcan tradition behind this story, or even directly to the question of the story's historicity before undertaking a careful analysis of the literary structure of the Marcan pericope as it lies before us. All we have before us is this text. Commentators seem to forget that the only direct access we have is to the complicated text Mark has left us. One can get behind the text only by going through it, not by executing an end run around it. Too many questions for the historical Jesus. Try the end run. The narrative of the plucking of the grain on the Sabbath belongs to the form critical category of dispute story, Streitgespräch. With many variations, the form has three main parts. First, the setting of the stage. Second, the question or objection. Third, the response or responses of Jesus, often in the form of a counter question. Applying this grid to the somewhat idiosyncratic case of Mark 2, 23 to 28, we can discern the following elaborate structure. And here I would ask you to follow with the text of Mark's gospel, all the better if you have the Greek text in front of you. Part one. In the setting of the stage, verse 23, two key protagonists are introduced in the two halves of the verse. Jesus, who does nothing provocative as he walks through the field of grain, but who will reply to the objection raised, and his disciples, who perform the provocative act of plucking the grain, but who say nothing in their own defense. As a glance forward to Jesus' first reply from Scripture shows in verses 25 and 26, this two-part introduction creates the pattern of distinction yet connection between the leader and his followers, Jesus and his disciples, that is then taken up in the scriptural narrative, David and those with him. So, part one, setting of the stage, verse 23. Part two, perhaps it is this need to create the pattern of distinction yet connection in verse 23 that explains why the mention of the people raising the objection, the Pharisees, is delayed until the beginning of the second major part of the story the question that raises the objection in verse 24. The two verbs of action in the question reinforce the pattern of distinction yet connection. The first verb, ida, look, see, is an imperative addressed to Jesus, as is made clear by the introductory clause, and the Pharisees said to him, not to them, to him. Jesus is asked to observe and explain what the second verb then describes, namely what the disciples are doing, poyusin, on the Sabbath. Notice Jesus is doing nothing. The problem is what the disciples are doing. The disciples are performing the objectionable action, but Jesus as their teacher is considered responsible for it, a common view in the ancient world, both Jewish and pagan. We see the same thing with Greek philosophers and their disciples. The underlying pattern of distinguishing the teacher from his disciples and yet connecting him with them is thus carried forward from the setting of the scene into the question that, uh, that poses the objection. This brings us to part three. This pattern of distinction yet connection is continued in the first of Jesus' replies to the Pharisees verses 25 and 26, but not in the second or third reply, verse 27 and verse 28. In the first reply, verses 25 and 26, 
the story of David visiting the sanctuary at Nob, 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10, is condensed and altered in such a way that both verse 25 and verse 26 reflect the pattern of distinction yet connection that has been introduced in the setting of the stage and continued in the raising of the objection. In verse 25 in the Greek text, not in all English translations, but in the Greek text of verse 25, David alone is mentioned at the beginning of the story just as Jesus alone was mentioned at the beginning of the pericope, with all the verbs narrating the action put in the singular, what David did when he was in need and he felt hungry. Only after the basic narrative about David is given does verse 25 end somewhat awkwardly with the addition, he and those with him, autos kai hoi metautu, tacked on somewhat awkwardly at the end of the verse when the whole verse was simply about David. The pattern of distinction yet connection is clear. The same is true in the continuation of the story in verse 26. In the first half of the verse, 26a, David alone in the Greek text is said to enter the house of God and eat the loaves restricted to the priest. This corresponds to the mention of David alone in most of verse 25. Then in verse 26b, we are told that David gave the loaves to those with him as well. Notice the second chi in the Greek text there, as well or also. This corresponds to the awkward he and those with him at the end of verse 25. Once one realizes that all three main parts of the dispute, the setting of the stage, the question, the first reply, are contoured according to the underlying pattern of distinction yet connection between leader and followers, one is struck by the sudden and total disappearance of this pattern in the second and third replies of Jesus. The second reply, verse 27, is an axiom-like statement of a general truth about the anthropological or humanitarian goal of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for human beings, not human beings for the Sabbath, or if you prefer using man in generic sense in the singular, just simply to get a singular noun at that point. I'll point out later why I want a single noun there. So excuse me if for the moment I say the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's anthropos there, human being. This reply mentions, notice, neither the leader, Jesus or David, nor the followers, the disciples and those with him. The third reply, verse 28, a Christological trump card, mentions Jesus under the third person description of son of man, but makes no corresponding mention of his followers. At least in Mark's redaction, the emphasis of the final reply is clearly Christological being focused on Jesus alone. The Son of Man is Lord also, Kai again, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Also, in addition to his being the Son of Man with power to forgive sins back in the first dispute story in 210, we need inclusio of the two first references to Son of Man in Mark. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. And then, just in case you forgot that, the Son of Man also has, is also Lord of the Sabbath. Thus, in contrast to verses 27 plus 28, verses 23 to 26 stand out as a tightly composed structural unit. Unity is reinforced by the repetition of key phrases in the Greek, like, it is not lawful, uk existin, in verses 24 and 26, and the key verb do, poiusin, apoiusin, in verses 24 and 25, phrases that are absent in verses 27 and 28. So from this structural analysis now, let us try to go to a hypothetical original form of the story. The fact that the distinction yet connection pattern is present only in the first of Jesus' replies is all the more striking when one realizes that this formal structuring pattern is not present in the original story of David at Nob in 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10. 
in the Old Testament story, in both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, as well as the Qumran fragments we now have from Cave 4, David is desperately alone as he flees from King Saul's murderous wrath. Only David interacts with the priest at Nob, and only he receives the loaves of the presence. As part of his lie to the priest, he mentions that some young men, that is soldiers in Saul's army, let's not hope pages, that he is supposed to meet somewhere else, will be there somewhere else. But strangely, the pages are off scene entirely. Since the following narrative never mentions these young men or pages, David's reference to them seems to be simply part of his ruse, justifying his highly irregular request for a number of loaves of bread that are supposed to be consumed only by priests. Thus, neither in the story of David at Nob, nor in the subsequent narrative of David's activity do those with him exist in the Old Testament account. Those with him are present in an awkward fashion in the first reply of the Mark and Dispute in 2.23 to 28, apparently for one reason only. The reply in verses 25 to 26 forms an organic part of the whole dispute story in verses 23 to 26, which is structured according to the distinction yet connection pattern, totally absent in verses 27 and 28. As I say, it is telling that just as this pattern disappears as verse 27 begins, the literary unity of the dispute story is disturbed by a new introductory phrase. And he said to them, Kayelegan autois. This phrase or its equivalent is used elsewhere in Mark to connect once isolated material into larger wholes. This seems to be its function here as well. The previous two uses of the verb to say, lego, in our dispute story, verse 24 and verse 25, make perfect sense. They belong there. They introduced and bound together the objection of the Pharisees in verse 24, the reply of Jesus in verse 25. The sudden reappearance of, and he said to them in verse 27, when Jesus has been speaking all along, serves no purpose within the literary structure, which it actually disrupts. This literary disruption coincides with the disruption in thought as the pattern of distinction yet connection, which has structured the whole pericope up until now, suddenly disappears. All this points to a likely understanding of the tradition history of Mark 2, 23 to 28. In my opinion, the original compact form of the story consisted of the setting of the stage, verse 23, the question, verse 24, and Jesus' reply in verses 25 to 26, all three parts being bound tightly together by the pattern of distinction yet connection between leader and followers. The complete absence of such a pattern in the second and third replies, which lack the same structural integration into the main narrative, suggests that both verse 27, the anthropological argument, and verse 28, the explicit Christological argument, were added secondarily, either at the same time or in separate stages. In itself, this judgment does not decide whether these two isolated sayings ultimately come from the historical Jesus. All this judgment affirms is that these two sayings did not originally belong to the narrative of the plucking of the grain on the Sabbath. To anticipate for a moment what we shall soon see, I would further propose that the reason why these two replies in verses 27 and 28 were added, thus producing a dispute story overloaded with a number of discrete arguments at the end of the story, the reason why they were added is that the original reply was increasingly felt in the course of time to be inadequate. One might draw a rough analogy here from text criticism. In text criticism, the reading that is judged to be the Lexio Difficilior, the more difficult reading, tends to be judged the original reading. To apply the analogy here, if verses 25 and 26, the first reply, form the original ending of the story, 
one can readily understand why the more intelligible or cogent endings of verses 27 to 28, two replies that explicitly mention the Sabbath, the first one doesn't, should be added to bolster the argument of Jesus. If, on the other hand, verses 27 and 28 form the original ending to the dispute, it is very difficult to see why the problematic reply, how problematic we will see in a moment, it is very difficult to see why the problematic reply of verses 25 and 26 should have been inserted into the middle of the story. Indeed, as I hope to show, the inadequacy of the first response raises some questions about the historicity of the original form of the story. Let us therefore go to the question of the historicity of this original form I've tried to isolate. Let us suppose then, as a working hypothesis, that the original form of the dispute about plucking grain on the Sabbath consisted of Mark 2.23, setting the scene, 2.24, the question, and 25 to 26, a reply, a scriptural argument from 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10. If we grant this hypothesis, what considerations argue for or against the judgment that this tradition reaches back to some incident in the public ministry of the historical Jesus? In my opinion, a number of considerations tip the scales against historicity. First, there is the granted vague general point emphasized by E.P. Sanders. Having Pharisees suddenly pop up in the middle of a grain field on the Sabbath to object to the disciples' activities strains credulity. It almost looks like something out of a Broadway musical. Oh, what a beautiful morning, or oh, what a beautiful Sabbath. You can see the Pharisee chorus dancing through the grain fields. Are we to imagine that Pharisees regularly patrolled grain fields on the Sabbath looking for possible violations? people who suspiciously have the munchies on the Sabbath? Or have the Pharisees sent out a special commission to spy on Jesus and his disciples in this particular grain field on this particular Sabbath? Granted, this consideration does not render the account in 2.23.26 unhistorical, but it does begin to raise some questions. Uh, this doubt is reinforced by the grave difficulty that any critical historian will detect in Jesus' reply in 225 to 26. The reply begins auspiciously enough in a clever rhetorical flourish found in both the rabbinic and the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition. Jesus parries a question with another question, typically rabbinic. You probably all heard the story of little Jacob coming home from his Brooklyn yeshiva and finding Daddy in the armchair reading the New York Times, and little Jacob scratches his head and says, Daddy, why do Jews always answer one question with another question? And his father replies, why not? <laughs> it is just the rabbinic way of arguing. And so Jesus parries a question with another question, perfectly good Jewish rabbinic approach. But the way the counter question begins in verse 25 signals the problems to come. Did you never read what David did? Beware of a single word that may hang you. Did you never read what David did? Now let us remember what the supposed historical situation in Mark 2:23 to 26 is, if we want to take this as a historical fact. Challenged by some Pharisees, who are noted for their exact and exacting study of scripture. Jesus, Jesus counter-challenges them on their home ground. Exact knowledge of the written scripture. Did you never read? Jesus, therefore, is not appealing to some stray oral tradition or his own made-up-on-the-spot version of the David story. He consciously challenges the experts in the scriptures to recall and then properly understand a given text of scripture, namely 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10. Okay, the problem is Jesus, at least the Mark in Jesus, proceeds in the presence of the scriptural experts to mangle and distort the text of the story, whether we read it 
the text in its Masoretic Hebrew form, the alternate form found at Qumran fragment of 4Q Samuel B, the Septuagintal form, which often agrees with 4Q Samuel B against the Masoretic text, interestingly, or the later Targumic Aramaic form. Whatever form you use, he mangles it. We've seen some of the inaccuracies already. Jesus claims that David had companions with him when he came to the priest at Nob and that David gave some of the loaves of the presence to those with him. Neither the presence of David's companions nor David's act of giving bread to them is to be found anywhere in the Old Testament text, be it the Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic form. Indeed, when the priest at the sanctuary meets David, he asks with trepidation, why are you alone and no one is with you? It almost sounds like the original author wanted to refute Jesus' argument. Why are you alone and no one is with you? In other words, the text of 1 Samuel 21 2 directly and blatantly contradicts what Jesus claims the text says. Moreover, 1 Samuel 21 2 to 10 never states explicitly that David, let alone his non existent companions, is hungry and eats the loaves then and there. Such details might be inferred from David's request. But since the text never says that David eats the loaves at Nob, one might infer instead that David is providing himself with food for a subsequent journey, a sort of viaticum. A more serious problem lies in the basically irrelevant nature of the scripture text Jesus chooses in order to defend his disciples' behavior. Nothing in the narrative of 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10 would cause one to think that David's request for food occurs on a Sabbath. To be sure, the Torah specifies that the loaves of the presence are to be replaced with fresh loaves every Sabbath, but the story in 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10 in no way connects the priest's gift of the loaves to David with the regular replacement of the loaves on the Sabbath. Nor is there any indication in Jewish sources prior to 70 CE that at the time of Jesus, the events in 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10 were generally understood to have taken place on the Sabbath. In a sense, the attempt by some modern commentators to read the Sabbath into Jesus' appeal to David's action misses the point. Since Jesus stresses that David's violation involved what David did, eating food that only priests should eat, and not when he ate it, a point Jesus never raises in the story. Oddly, the mark in Jesus, who freely interpolates a number of other details into the text of 1 Samuel, is careful to adhere to the written text on this pivotal point of was it on the Sabbath or not. Despite Jesus' other additions and despite his explicit reference to the Sabbath in his second and third replies in verses 27 and 28, the mark in Jesus does not venture to insert the element of the Sabbath into the story of David, even though this is the one addition that would have made the story truly relevant through the objection raised by the Pharisees in Mark 2.24. Without this correspondence, the case of David simply illustrates a general claim that dire human need or an emergency situation can override details of religious claim, religious law, a claim that does not fit the Markan narrative where nothing has been said about the disciples being in dire need or facing an emergency. We're not even told in the Markan text that they're hungry. The synoptic parallels add that, sensing you need something here to connect the Jesus event with the text of 1 Samuel. Mark never says that the disciples are in some sort of emergency situation. They haven't eaten, eaten in days, etc., anything of the sort. Still more embarrassing is the error about the identity of the priest to whom David speaks at Nob. Both the Hebrew and the Greek forms of 1 Samuel 21.2 make clear that the priest whom David addresses is Ahimelech. No other individual priest is mentioned as being on the scene. In fact, no other priest is mentioned by name in the story. There is therefore no basis in the Old Testament text of the story for the mistake the Mark and Jesus makes in claiming that the high priest in charge at the time was Abiathar. In Mark 
how David entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest. Abiathar Akiathra Os. Abiathar, at least according to the most reliable Old Testament tradition, was the son of Ahimelech, with whom the mark in Jesus has confused him. It is amusing to see how past commentators have searched high and low for any and every exegetical escape hatch to save them from having to admit that Jesus, at least as Mark presents him in 226, makes a flagrant error about what the text of 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10 says. Alas, none of the escape hatches is convincing unless one is determined beforehand to be convinced. The conclusion we must draw, both from this error and from the other examples of Jesus' inaccurate retelling of the Old Testament story is simple and obvious. The recounting of the David and Ahimelech incident shows both an appalling ignorance of what the Old Testament text actually says and a striking inability to construct a convincing argument from the story. Now, one might object that all these rationalistic observations I'm making fail to appreciate that Jesus in sovereign fashion is rewriting the Old Testament story according to his own purposes. It's all midrash, and midrash like charity covers a multitude of sins. A simple reply to this objection is that without the much needed insertion of the Sabbath into the David story, the purpose of Jesus' supposed midrashic rewriting remains unclear. More to the point though, the defense that Jesus is with sovereign freedom rewriting the story of David at Nob does not fit the scene Mark depicts in 2.23 to 26, the scene we are testing for its historicity. As we consider the scene, we need to recall the agonistic culture of the ancient Mediterranean world where public debates between contending parties, usually male, were a matter of honor and shame. According to Mark, Jesus has chosen to counter the Pharisees' challenge by challenging them on their knowledge of the written text of 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10, did you never read? Jesus' challenge hopelessly falls to pieces if he immediately proceeds to document his own glaring ignorance of the text of 1 Samuel 21, 2 to 10, which according to Mark's account, he does. Now at this point, some conservative scholars might be all too willing to deny the historicity of Mark 2, 23 to 26, thus dodging a major theological problem by assigning the embarrassing mistakes to Mark rather than to Jesus, but that really would help an evangelical position, I'm not quite sure. However, a methodologically rigorous quest for the historical Jesus, by definition, does not admit theological concerns into its weighing of the arguments for and against historicity. If the historical Jesus made these embarrassing mistakes in his debate, then so be it. The historical Jesus was a scriptural ignoramus. An honest historian must let the chips fall where they may, and you cannot suddenly take out your broom to try to rearrange the chips on the floor. That said, <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? The lecturer giver and the lecturer taketh away. Blessed be the name of the lecturer. <laughs> That said, I think that these glaring errors in Jesus' scriptural argument offer a reason for assigning the story to early Christians rather than to Jesus, but the reason I would put forward is a historical one, not a theological one. If there is anything certain about the ministry of the historical Jesus and its denouement, it is that Jesus was an impressive teacher and debater. Amid the fierce composition for public esteem and influence among Jews in first century Palestine, he acquired a fair amount of fame and following to the point that he was deemed dangerous. This basic picture of the historical Jesus seems incompatible with the Jesus Mark unwittingly portrays. 
This mark in Jesus is not only an ignoramus, but a stupid ignoramus who foolishly challenges scripture experts to a public debate about the proper reading of a specific text only to prove immediately to both his disciples and his opponents how ignorant he is of the text. From Whedon onwards, we have forever heard these stupid, ignorant, blind disciples. Could it be that they're actually reflecting some of the ignorance and stupidity of their teacher? Not even Whedon is willing to go that far. If this scene gives us a true picture of the biblical knowledge and teaching skill of the historical Jesus, then the natural and very effective response of the Pharisees would have been not fierce anger and concerted opposition, but gleeful mockery, what's more effective in a popular religious scene. The Pharisees would have laughed their heads off and invited the populace to do the same at this uneducated woodworker who insisted on making a fool of himself in public by displaying his abysmal ignorance of the very scripture text on which he proposed to instruct the supposedly ignorant Pharisees. I dare say, if this was the actual competence of the historical Jesus in teaching and debating, his movement would not have lasted a month in first century Jewish Palestine. Such a portrayal of Jesus not only fails to explain his widespread popularity, his accordingly violent end, and the impact of his ministry on subsequent history, it does not even square with one of the few significant traits of the historical Jesus that Josephus highlights in Book 18 of the Antiquities. Jesus, a wise man, was a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure, and he gained a following among many Jews. Consequently, I incline to the view that in Mark 2, 23 to 26, we have a polemic composition created by Christian Jews in Palestine prior to 70 CE, the approximate time of the composition of Mark's gospel. Now, the natural objection to my suggestion is that then there is no likely setting in life, Zitzenleben, for such a story among early Christian Jews in Palestine. Are we to imagine that Christian Jews made such a habit out of plucking grain on the Sabbath that it became a major point of dispute with their Jewish neighbors, thus forcing the Christians to create this anecdote by way of justification? In reply to this objection, I need only repeat a point I made earlier. Despite the theoretical purpose of addressing and confuting one's adversaries outside, most religious apologetics and polemics are directed inward. The overall situation of a hopelessly small group of pre-70 Palestinian Jews for Jesus, who feel beleaguered within a sea of Jews not for Jesus, is the real Zitzim Laban of this dispute story. It is a prime example of how religious polemics generate more heat than light. In sum, while certainty is not to be had in such matters, I incline to the view that the core story of the plucking of the grain on the Sabbath, verses 23 to 26, is a not especially adroit polemical creation of Christian Jews in Palestine in the pre-70 period. Well, our survey of all the gospel narratives dealing with the Sabbath has had a disappointing upshot. None of the Sabbath narratives apparently goes back to Jesus. But what about individual sayings on the Sabbath that form and tradition criticism isolate and classify as originally independent logia that was secondarily attached to a narrative? Here, I think our results will be better, though limitations of time permit me only to outline my argument. No doubt the most popular candidate for authenticity is Mark 2.27, the second reply of Jesus in the plucking of the grain story. Personally, I do not feel quite as confident as some other critics in hailing the saying as certainly authentic. The arguments for historicity are rather elusive and indirect, but at least we have arguments. First, there is the argument from Jesus' characteristic way of speaking. Many scholars detect in the sayings most often attributed to Jesus a tendency to frame his teaching in crisp, striking 
memorable proverbs and aphorisms structured along the lines of antithetical parallelism and or chiasm. This is certainly true of 227, which displays a remarkable fusion of antithetical parallelism and chiasm in a short, dense logion. Literally in the Greek, it's hard to represent actually in English, but literally in the Greek, the logion runs, the Sabbath for the human was made and not the human for the Sabbath, is both antithetical and chiastic at the same time. Second, unlike the muddled argument about David in verses 25 to 26, the mashal in verse 27 is perfectly intelligible and plausible in the mouth of a Jewish Palestinian teacher around the year 28 CE. The same cannot be said of the clumsy argument about David in verses 25 to 26 or the Christological trump card in verse 28. As a Jewish parallel to verse 27, Commentators invariably cite the saying of Rabbi Shimeon ben Manasha, who was active around 180 CE, a saying preserved in the great rabbinic Midrash on Exodus, the Mechilta. The saying goes, quote, the Sabbath is handed over to you, but you are not handed over to the Sabbath. At the same time, though, there is an intriguing difference between this Mechilta saying and Jesus is Logion. Rabbi Shimeon says, you, his fellow Israelites, you, to whom the Sabbath was given, namely by God on Mount Sinai, when he gave the Torah to Israel. Jesus instead speaks of the human being, or anthropos, for whose sake the Sabbath was made or came into existence, again a Torah. Both of these phrases hark back to the creation narrative in Genesis 1. This reaching back to the order of God's good creation before it was marred by sin is typical of Jewish apocalyptic thought. It is found elsewhere in Jesus' teaching, notably in his teaching on marriage and divorce in Mark 10, 2-9 that we saw yesterday. In a larger sense, it is part and parcel of Jesus' proclamation of the coming yet present kingdom of God, which will bring God's original intentions for his good creation to fulfillment. In verse 27, Jesus' halakha is eschatological halakha, and this prime example of his eschatological ethic is notably lacking in any Christological overtone. Hence, while the criterion from coherence may not be as probative as multiple attestation or discontinuity, I think that coherence makes it more likely than not that 227 does come from Jesus. The same cannot be said of 228. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. This logion has generated a flood of literature, much of it focused on a hypothetical original Aramaic form with Bar Enasha, the son of man, possibly having a collective sense, humanity, human beings, the human race. In my view, such theories are beside the point, since verse 28 is most likely a Christian creation. To establish this claim fully would take another lecture or another article. In fact, I've contributed an article precisely on this point to a feshrift for the great professor and teacher of the Epistle to the Hebrews, Albert Van Waugh, and the Feshrift now has turned into a Feshrift in honor of him being made a cardinal of the Roman Church. So Harry, stick with the Epistle of the Hebrews and you'll go far. <laughs> it's high time we got back to lay cardinals, which we once had. But permit me simply to make two brief points about verse 28. First, among the synoptic Son of Man sayings, there is a clear tendency in the later evangelist, Matthew and Luke, to introduce Son of Man sayings that speak of the Son of Man's present status and action in the time of the church. That is a secondary development. This is quite different from the more traditional sayings about Son of Man that focus on one of three topics, the public ministry of Jesus, his death and resurrection, or his future coming in glory and or the final judgment. I would claim that Mark 2.28 already signals 
the later Mathean and Lucan tendency to move the Son of Man into the present time of the church. Second point, in John's gospel, with his realized eschatology, it is not surprising that this tendency reaches its ultimate point. The Son of Man likewise moves into the present time of Christian believers, so much so that the Son of Man becomes the object of a profession of faith. The man born blind in 935, do you believe in the Son of Man? So unintelligible was that to later Christian scribes. They changed it to Son of God in later Greek text because it made no sense to them for Jesus to ask, do you believe in the Son of Man? So much has the Son of Man become the present Lord of the church that he becomes the object of belief profession, and the blind man says, yes, Lord, I do believe. The Son of Man is the one who gives eternal life now to the believer in the church. Hence, the Son of Man is the one who gives eternal life now to the believer who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, 650. Notice how Son of Man suddenly reappears in that Eucharistic part of the Bread of Life discourse. There is, however, even a more precise parallel between Mark 2.28 and John's Christology, however strange that might seem, putting Mark and John together. Mark 2.28 stands out as unique in both form and content because nowhere else in the four Gospels do we have the precise grammatical pattern of the Son of Man as subject of the sentence plus the copulative verb is plus a predicate nominative to be exact, a noun in the nominative followed by a genitive noun with the definite article, that precise pattern. And all of this describing the authority or status of the subject. Strikingly, when we combine Mark 2.28's claim to unique status on the part of Jesus with the sentence's unique grammatical structure Son of man, subject, copy of the verb is, plus predicate nominative, noun with genitive definite article. Oddly, the closest comparable pronouncements anywhere in the four Gospels are the I am plus predicate statements in John's Gospel. Both in its structure and in its high Christological claim, Mark's the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, structurally, finds its closest functional equivalent in Johannine sayings like, I am the bread of life, including predicate nominative plus genitive with definite article. In other words, in Mark 2.28, the Son of Man does not simply have authority over the Sabbath. Remember 2.10, he has authority to forgive sins. No, 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 it's not said simply the Son of Man has authority over the Sabbath. He is Kyrios, he is Lord, Master, Owner, Controller of the Sabbath. Mark 2.28 does not simply supply a third argument after the first inept scriptural argument and the second broad, perhaps too broad, humanitarian argument. The absolute Christological claim of verse 28 cuts off all further argument and decides the issue, period. Christological trump card. Shut up, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Basta, end of argument. The saying appeals not to what the Son of Man once did during his earthly life, or will do at the parousia, but to who the Son of Man is now for the believer. Unlike verse 27, verse 28 is simply not conceivable as an argument that one Jew would make to another Jew around 28 CE. By contrast, verse 28 is quite conceivable in its pivotal position at the end of the fourth story of the Markan cycle of five dispute stories, which stretches from 2-1 down to 3-6, the grand first Markan Galilean cycle of Streikgespräche. On the one hand, Mark 2:28 looks backward to the first dispute story which contains the first Son of Man saying in the whole of Mark's Gospel, the Son of Man has authority to, to forgive sins on earth, to ten. Hence, of course, the Son of Man is also the Kai, is all, just in case you forgot the first reference, is also Lord of the Sabbath. Take that. <laughs> 
On the other hand, Mark 2.28 prepares for the final dispute in the cycle, the healing of the man with the withered hand, which focuses on what Jesus himself, and no longer his disciples, does on the Sabbath. With his healing, life-giving power, Jesus shows himself to be truly the Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2.28, thus in Janus' style, acts as a clasp between the first and the last dispute stories in the cycle. It most likely comes from Mark or the pre-Markan redactor of the dispute cycle. It would just be a little bit too convenient that just by accident that story originally ended with that pivotal statement which allowed a marvelous looking backwards and forwards. As Dana Carvey used to say on Church Lane Saturday Night Live, how convenient, a little bit too convenient. Well, left with only Mark 2.27 as a possible candidate, can we find any other sayings on the Sabbath that probably come from the historical Jesus? Fortunately, there is another type, a whole different gotum of Sabbath saying that surprisingly enjoys multiple attestation, namely Jesus' rhetorical questions about permissible work on the Sabbath. Interestingly, most of these questions seem to be secondary insertions into narratives of Sabbath healings. For instance, in Matthew 12, 11, Matthew inserts into Mark's story of the man with the withered hand the separate question, which of you, if he has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of him and draw him up? In the special Lucan story of the man with dropsy, Luke has an alternate version of the same question. Luke 14, 5, which of you, if your son or ox falls into a cistern, will not immediately pull him up on the Sabbath? A third major form of this tradition of rhetorical questions about Sabbath practice is framed in Luke's special tradition about the bent over woman, 13, 15. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger to lead him away to drink? Interestingly, the first two questions deal with an unusual emergency situation, while the third deals with a need that would arise on every Sabbath. At the very least, though, we have multiple attestation of Jesus asking rhetorical questions about specific Sabbath practices. And thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that these questions were not merely theoretical. For example, the Damascus document forbids anyone on the Sabbath to pull an animal that falls into a cistern or pit out. Though a fragment from K4 at Qumran allows one to throw his own garment to a human being in such peril, not an animal. But no rope or ladder may be used, that would be too much like work. Indeed, as late as the third century CE Tosefta, the rabbis will not allow an animal to be drawn out of the pit on the Sabbath, though fodder may be tossed to the animal to keep it alive. Pointedly, however, both Mishnah and Tosefta allow the rescue of human life in such circumstances. Hence, it seems that Jesus is disagreeing with the Essenes and possibly the Pharisees on their rigorous approach to the rescue of animals and in the case of the Essenes, even of humans, on the Sabbath. Jesus' is saying about untying an ox or a donkey may present us with a different situation, since here Jesus may be arguing to a conclusion from a starting point accepted by all parties. Be that as it may, our rapid survey of Jesus' sayings on Sabbath halakha does yield significant insights. First, Jesus was not simply a grand ethical philosopher or Jewish cynic or a Thomas Jefferson propounding general truths. He waded into the murky waters of specific debates over Sabbath observance. The historical Jesus is the halakhic Jesus, something Christians of almost every stripe prefer to forget. Second, in his positions on the Sabbath, Jesus opposed sectarian rigor and sought to influence ordinary Jewish peasants who might have been attracted by the admirable rigorism of the stringently observant. Perhaps the best description of Jesus' approach is not so much liberal as commonsensical. Third, 
In these Sabbath sayings, we may have a rare instance of Jesus engaging at a distance the position of the Essenes. His face-to-face -face competitors were more likely the Pharisees, who, like himself, were competing for influence among the common people. Fourth, certain halakhic questions about the Sabbath that were of burning importance for sectarian rigorists are simply absent from Jesus' teaching. A prime example is the question of the distance one may walk on the Sabbath. One wonders, is this a mere accident in the transmission of traditions, or was Jesus, the itinerant Jesus, simply indifferent to questions of how far you could walk on the Sabbath? Fifth and finally, one sees how searching for the historical Jesus can alter perspectives. If we simply look at the Gospels as they stand, supposedly the great task of interpretation today, if we simply look at the Gospels as they stand, Jesus' words and deeds regarding the Sabbath loom much larger than, say, his teaching on divorce. Yet put into the sifter of the historical quest, much of the Sabbath material is eliminated while the basic teaching on divorce is strongly supported by multiple attestation, discontinuity, embarrass, embarrassment, and coherence. If nothing else, this is a sober reminder that the priorities and emphases of the historical Jesus may not be those of the early church or the evangelists, or at least not always. This reminder in turn raises an intriguing question. To what does the church today primarily look? Or on what does the church primarily base its ethical teaching? The historical Jesus or the canonical gospel? As one moves, say, from a Schweitzer to a Bultmann or a Barth and back again to Second Quest or Third Quest or Jesus Seminar, excuse me, what is the implied agenda what is the implied criterion of what we should do if the historical Jesus shows us one emphasis and the canonical gospel show us a rather different emphasis? An intriguing question, yes, to which does the church today look for guidance? An intriguing question, yes, but one that crosses the forbidden line from the historical quest into theology a dark place we dare not go in these lectures. <laughs> to go where no exegete has gone before, I will not go. What we can affirm so far is that the G Jesus' approach to the law was as complex and multifaceted as the law in the first century itself was. And to repeat our theme song, the Halakhic Jesus is the historical Jesus. We will underline that for the third and final time tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for your kind attention.